Tonight, a MedStar doctor hit and killed while his car was being stolen. It all happened here at this busy intersection. Patel was dropping something off to his girlfriend at 18th in Florida. I hadn't seen him all week, and he gave me the longest hug. And then you got to the corner of your eye, you see the car rolling. And he said, oh my god, my car. Thieves jumped in the Mercedes and took off. Witnesses say Patel was violently killed. That's the wording that they used. I mean, they ran him over and left him dead in the street. Seizing a running car, then violently running over the owner is murder. Carjackings are up 104% here in D.C. The city averaging almost three carjackings per day. I cannot believe that the capital of the United States of America can be that this way. You know, it makes it hard to even walk down the street and wonder, is that the guy that did it? Is that the guy that did it? You think the person who is walking free right now, two years later, hasn't done this again? Oh, I'm sure he has done it. I'm sure he has done it. And the man that jumped into his car for a joyride didn't hesitate to shatter him to pieces. It turns your entire world upside down to lose somebody in, in this way. You go through all the different stages we all hear about, and acceptance is the last one. The acceptance, I think, for a lot of us is not come. The violin part of it is the hardest part of losing Rockish. It's just how horrendously he was taken from us. Three-year-old med star Dr. Rakesh Patel was hit and killed by his own vehicle in March of 2022. He was dropping by his girlfriend's house in Northwest DC to say hello when a group of thieves stole his car seconds later, mowing him over. Now, two years later, no one has been identified or charged for his murder, leaving Dr. Patel's loved ones without answers, while carjackings in the nation's capital continue to skyrocket. Rakesh Patel grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, the son of parents that immigrated to the U.S. in hopes of fulfilling the American dream. They were successful. You know, my dad came here in, in Ohio. He became a doctor. Um, working to help people and raising five children who did the best they could to just be productive members of society. Rakesh was the baby. He was the best of the five of us. We will always say that he's, he was just warm. He always wanted to be around people. He, he never gave us any trouble, never. No. He was one of them, you know, did his work, I didn't have to push him for anything. A tight-knit family that made spending time together a priority. When he was little, 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 uh, probably four or five years old, and um, I'd ask my mom sometimes, hey, can I, can I put Rakesh to bed? And like, yeah, you can do it, okay. And he'd always want to read a book. He'd just cuddle up and read Winnie the Pooh. And I think as we got older, both of us just we love to read. It was a great way to grow up. We always had, <laughs> always had something exciting going on. Had you know, just like built-in best friends. <laughs> His sisters say Rockish was special. Rockish was my mom's favorite. They had a special bond. Rockish in in our language means full moon. Those who bear the name may have a loving and affectionate nature, which was especially true for Rakish. The youngest of the family had so much empathy, um, and he just wanted to see people happy. He was always there when you needed him. He was a loving, caring man. Eventually, Rakish would go on to UCLA to earn his undergraduate degree and then Ross University School of Medicine in the Caribbean. My dad was a doctor and we all saw him you know, he was a surgeon in the middle of the night, just getting up at, on a call to go help whoever needed it. Rockish growing up saw that and he had the same character in him. He was so smart um, and he just worked so hard. He was a straight A student. He ran track. Uh, he went to UCLA, became a doctor. Um, yeah, I think he, he dedicated his his short life to 
learning as much as he could and ultimately learning how to save people. His education also led him to Washington, D.C., where he worked at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, completing his residency and a fellowship in infectious disease. I was one of the people who got to interview him for his residency. When I interview people, I kind of want them to be themselves, so I talk about a lot of outside of the job and what are your ambitions, what do you like to do outside. Um, very easy to talk to, very open, somebody who was sit and talk to for hours so I actually rated him very highly I wanted him to come here and train both because he was easy to talk to but you got a genuine sense of the person he was I'm sorry he's very I guess very excited when he matched here to start his internal medicine training Patel was finishing his critical care fellowship at the time of his murder he passed away March March 8th and he would have been done June 30th so he was at the end of his training, put in all that hard work his whole life just to take care of people, and he was about three months away from, from finishing. Patel's compassionate nature always showed through, even when he thought no one was looking. We kind of found out stories from nurses, like, hey, you know your resident's bringing Mr. So-and-so in room whatever, a cup of coffee from McDonald's every day, just because he doesn't have family. While in the nation's capital, he met his girlfriend, Rachel, I don't know that I've ever felt more loved. And he was so caring and so kind. And, and he was so compassionate. On our fifth date, fourth or fifth, you know, we're still getting to know each other and, and I was really excited. And um, if we were supposed to go to a winery and the day before, uh, my, my dog got injured, couldn't be left alone. I canceled on him last minute, and I just thought, he's, he's a good one. He's, I don't want to let this one go. But I had to tell him, I'm sorry, I can't go because this happened. And, and he was so sweet, and he said, oh. Oh, that's all right, I'll bring the winery to us. <laughs> wow. Um, and he packed a perfect lunch with a couple bottles of wine and just little details that you wouldn't expect. And so the three of us went and had a picnic and it was, it was just a perfect afternoon. But on a seemingly normal night in March, their fairy tale came to a crashing halt. It was 8 p.m. on a Tuesday, and he double parked to just stop by for a second after work. I hadn't seen him all week, and he gave me the longest hug, this, the best hug I think I've ever gotten, and it was so tight, and I even tried to pull away to look at him, and I couldn't, and he wouldn't let me go. As they embraced, car thieves attacked, jumping into Patel's silver Mercedes and driving off. You got to the corner of your eye, you see the car rolling. And he said, oh my God, my car. And he ran down to the corner. In a panic, Patel chased after the car, not realizing it was stolen. I think, I, I can only assume that he thought what I thought, which was that the brake went out. And he was the type of person where he would run after it, thinking he doesn't want someone to get hurt. Patel caught up to the car, and that's when the carjackers ran him down, killing him in the intersection of 18th Street and Florida Avenue. All of this as Patel's girlfriend watched in horror. You don't imagine seeing the beautiful peachy pink swirls of the brain of the person that you love most on a Tuesday at 8. And that's what that looks like. It's just an absolute nightmare. I, I had just put my daughter to bed and I came out of the room and I guess um, my, my mom had been calling me and calling me and I didn't, didn't have my phone in there with me. We were just sitting home watching TV and we had a knock on our door and two policemen were there. So, can I help you officers? Can we come in? She said, sure. I got a call from my dad around 11 o'clock central time. Um, 
and it was so unexpected. I could see myself sitting on the couch with the kids, getting that phone call, looking down, telling my wife, hey, I have to take this, my fellow's calling me. So they come in and then they told me to sit down and they said, uh, we want you to talk to an officer in DC. They wouldn't tell me what it was about, but then they connected me to the officer uh, in a DC and the D DC officer told me, said, Mr. Patel, I'm so sorry to let you know that Rakesh is no more. I said, what do you mean? He says, he's no more. He got ran over. And my husband just looked at me and I'll never forget the look in his eyes. And he, he couldn't even get the words out, just we lost him. And what do you mean? And I remember falling to my knees and thinking, this couldn't be him. No, they, they haven't confirmed who it is. No, no, it wasn't Rakesh. My wife knew from the, from the tone in my voice. She said, oh my gosh, what happened? I said, I think one of my trainees is in a bad accident. He may even have passed away. So his internal medicine program director, who's my dear friend who I work with every day, I called her and I said, hey, Sal, I just got this call. And she's like, okay, um, you're not driving. You're a wreck. I'm going to come pick you up and we're going. And we, it took a while. 45 minutes at that time seems like days. Um, um, halfway there, I got confirmation from my fellow who had made it um, to 18th and Florida. And he said, hey, it's, it's true. Calling my parents, my parents just frantically saying, we've got to get to DC. We're going, we're going. And just, we lost him. We're, we're going. And I'm trying to get down there. That took the life out of me. Part of me was obviously thinking about him and his family. The other part was thinking about my other, his colleagues. So I started making the calls one by one saying, hey, got some bad news. So one by one, the message went out. And the shocking grief set in, which only turned worse when they realized the way Rakish was taken. Like this was no accident. When I first got the call, I thought it was an accident. This was a crime, and this person made an active decision and decided to take my brother's life that day. And this guy that chose to steal his car chose to blast through the intersection and hit Rockish with all four tires. The guy jumped in the car and drove over him on the curb. The violin part of it is the hardest part of losing Rakesh. It's just how horrendously he was taken from us. Just hours after the carjacking, Rakesh's car was found not far from the scene of the crime. Could it be true that this young doctor lost his life for a simple joy ride? He just ran over full speed. There are brakes in the car. If you wanted to, yeah, you could have stopped. From what I understand, a moment where the car could have slowed down or sped up, and sped up and turned a corner. And my brother was run over and torn to pieces. I asked even one of the detectives, did he just die? Even though I'm standing 10 feet from his open skull. And they just, he couldn't even answer. He just looked down and shook his head. Hours after Rakesh Patel was ran over by his own vehicle, DC police asked for the public's help in finding his killer. This driver, this, this murderer, he just crushed Rakesh's beautiful eyes into the intersection. It's just a black nothingness. And that sickening crunch that dozens of people heard, he cracked open his skull. It's difficult to, to think that there are people out there like that. As the suspects took a joy ride through the city, his car was captured by only a few nearby cameras. It's, it's, it's a little hard to believe in 
Washington, D.C. in a very public place. This was like a mile and a half away from the White House. And how could we not have eyes on what went on? A day later, Patel's car was found along Roxana Road in Northwest, just five miles and 20 minutes away from where it was stolen. You can't tell me that this criminal who wanted to go for a joyride, because they dumped the car. You can watch the video, a couple of guys washing the car. They just wanted to go for a joyride. Video released by DC police show two men getting out of a car and cleaning it as one appears to carry a bottle of bleach. When they found his car where it was parked, there was uh, neighbors of the this, this suspicious. And you can see that on the video. And they, you know, tried to bleach the whole car. Surveillance video from a neighbor gives a different angle, showing several men on Roxana Road. The neighbor Fox 5 spoke to that day says the car ended up in front of his home. I actually called the police this morning to report the car as a suspicious thing, but they transferred me to parking enforcement. Witnesses also say they spotted the men cleaning the car and one can be seen walking away with what looks like floor mats. Three or four guys came up in two different cars and parked the Mercedes here in front of the house. And then they got out and they got into another car and left. Police identifying the men in the video as suspects in the killing of Dr. Patel, but to this day, no one has been caught for his murder. You think the person who is walking free right now, two years later, hasn't done this again? Oh, I'm sure he has done again. I'm sure he has carjacked again, you know? Because you know he's not going to get caught. It's hard not to think about the person who did this. And if they had been critically injured and ended up at the hospital, how my brother would have done everything in his power to help them. You know, maybe it takes the cops 50 years to catch them. Maybe whether you believe in God or karma, they will pay for it. They can enjoy their life now because they are still out there. They still roam the streets. It could happen to anyone again. Rakesh Patel's death comes as carjackings and auto thefts increase nationwide and across the district, affecting prominent politicians and regular citizens alike. Mike Gill has died after being shot during a deadly carjacking spree in the district. This shooting that happened here in Northeast in the Noma neighborhood was a random carjacking that ended in murder. A 12 year old has been arrested in connection with an attempted carjacking in Northwest. Um, it has not only gotten national news, but international news. Gregory Pemberton, chairman of the DC Police Union, remembers Patel's case well. This was a really devastating case. These are brazen, cold blooded criminals uh, who are now covering their tracks after they've murdered someone. Uh, just a horrific circumstance, uh, and it, it sort of goes to the, the brazenness uh, of these criminals out here and the lack of accountability for criminals who do engage in this kind of behavior. This as carjackings hit record numbers in the nation's capital. In 2023, we ended the year with 958 carjackings, which is the largest number of carjackings the city has ever seen. It was a 109% increase over the year prior, which is 2022, which I think had 450 uh, carjackings, which is another astronomical number. To be in a city where we're ap approaching 1,000 carjackings a year is, is just mind-boggling as to how we've allowed it to get to this place. Since Dr. Patel's death, almost 1,500 carjackings have been reported in the district. About 27% of those cases have been closed. While many are committed by adults, an alarming number of incidents involved teens. In both 2022 and 2023, juveniles made up more than 60% of carjacking arrests in the district, according to police. Some calling DC a city under siege. It's the thrill of being involved in the criminal activity and knowing that there's no consequence for this, even if they're caught, uh, that they're not going to go to jail, that they're going to go through family court and, and this idea of restorative justice where there is no jail time. The increased crime stealing a sense of security for frustrated residents and businesses. And I think there is a narrative that's out there that um, if you don't have to go into D.C., you shouldn't. And what 
the way that that manifests itself in is businesses close, so businesses move out of the city, people, citizens move out of the city. I think that, that a lot of that ties back to crimes and in particular carjacking because it's something that everyone can sort of palpably sense that, you know, I, I drive in and out of the city and I'm hearing about all these carjackings. I don't want to become a victim. That fear forcing many to leave the district entirely. I was carjacked while making deliveries for my own business and that, um, you know, that's scary. It's not something that I ever thought would happen to me. I just can't take a risk uh, staying open or investing any more money into an area and a business that DC is not going to um, provide for. The restaurant I'm looking at right now had four shootings there four weeks ago. Three months before that, a gentleman was shot five times, four doors down. Um, the U.S. Senator uh, Rand Paul's uh, associate was stabbed a half a block down. This is just one block of H Street. There's a middle ground between not being a police state and making an environment that uh, businesses would want to feel secure and people would want to come in and spend money. Violent crime numbers in the district have skyrocketed so much so that in March of 2024, two years after Patel's death, 70 DC business groups penned a letter to the mayor and other city officials demanding that they quote, take action to target the small group of organized and repeated criminals responsible for most of the violent offenses. And this, this is really on the council and the mayor. I think this is where it's frustrating is because the city council in particular uh, thinks that these people, these criminals need to be protected somehow and that we need to pass laws that prohibit the government from holding them accountable. When it comes to current law regarding carjackings in the district, Pemberton says. There is a, a criminal offense for carjacking and a separate one for armed carjacking. Um, those carry penalties of 27 and 40 years uh, respectively. Uh, the problem is not that we need new statutes, it's that we need the prosecutors and the judges in the city to hold to the statutes that we already have. Uh, so for example, when we arrest somebody and, and then later indict them for an armed carjacking uh, and that person goes to court and is convicted, the I think what citizens broadly would expect is that that person needs to do some serious jail time. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing, even in the cases of violent murders, even murders of innocent children, uh, defendants are getting eight years, 10 years, six years, uh, and carjackings are significantly less than that. Pemberton says with a laissez-faire approach to sentencing, these criminals won't back down. When you have a suspect that rips an innocent woman out of her car at a stoplight, a pistol whips her and then steals the car with her four-year-old child in the back, re realizes there's a child in the back, dumps the child at an intersection four blocks away, and then drives off with the car, that person is apprehended, uh, arrested, and then later convicted of that crime. That person shouldn't be getting, you know, one, two, three years in prison. Like th th this, These are people that need to go away. And, and not only does that uh, send a message to the person who committed the crime, but others who observe that who may be, have some propensity to get involved in that kind of behavior are now gonna be deterred. A reality that has haunted Rakish's friends and family since his murder. You know, it makes it hard to even walk down the street and wonder, is that the guy that did it? Is that the guy that did it? And I don't do that every day anymore, but they're still out there. I didn't know that this was such a problem in D.C. Um, until it happened to him. You know, I don't know what the answers are. I don't know what is going to stop people from, from committing crimes. Everyone has the right to life, and you're not allowed to take someone's life away from them and just continue to be a part of society. They have got cameras in the capital of United States of America. I think they don't care. If you don't try to find the criminals and do the due diligence to punish them, they are going to be free. And it makes you angry. Like, why? Why is this happening? The other part is it really makes you scared. I drive those streets every day. Could be me.
could be my wife if she's driving in D.C., could be somebody's mom, and that, that's the, the senseless part, is it's innocent bystanders. So it, it makes you scared. As these violent acts spark questions on D.C.'s crime response, there's one thing most people agree on. Something has to change. So what has the response been from leaders in a city that's growing more chaotic by the day? The answer may surprise you. The man that jumped into his car for a joyride didn't hesitate to shatter him to pieces. It was just such a careless, like senseless act. I cannot believe that the capital of the United States of America can be that disarray. It could just be joyriding, it could be um, stealing the car to go commit other crimes where they drive throughout the city and rob stores, rob persons, and then ultimately they just abandon the car somewhere. So we really need to get a handle on this sort of, you know, this sort of street activity, which obviously has people concerned. Days after Rakesh Patel's tragic death, the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser, spoke on the incident. There's no more important issue for us right now uh, than dealing with people who are committing crimes in our city. Uh, and we, we saw one um, person who probably didn't intend to kill anybody, but did and devastated a family. This particular remark drew criticism from people accusing the mayor of excusing the crime in this fatal incident. I mean, unless she has more information than, you know, the police or the public, I don't know how she could know the, like what the intention of this person was. When I heard that, I said, how can she say that? I, would, I, I, would, I, I wonder what she would have said if it was her own son. You know, things would have changed. He says it was unintentional. How can you run somebody over unintentionally? There are brakes in the car. I bet if it was her son or her relative, she wouldn't have said that. I guess my concern is um, just whether there's motivation to help prevent this from happening to more people. I hope that she, that she is able to just think about the things she says um, and how they might affect the people who hear them. At the end of the day, I just I hope that she understands how what she said affected my family and um, and does better in the future. And what are your thoughts on on the comments from the mayor following his passing? You have people whose gut reaction is to say, well, he probably didn't mean to do it. If that's your gut instinct, that that's your gut reaction, it's sociopathic and sick. The only thought I have is that when you have this like kind of twisted, warped mentality where you jump to the criminal's defense, like there's, that's a problem. I understood what was trying to be expressed, but I, I think it, um, I guess at the time, the worry was maybe it did not um, show enough remorse for the, for the victim. Listen, I think the, the mayor's comment may have been a little clumsy, but the point that she's trying to make is that uh, criminals feel like they can do whatever they want without being held accountable in the city. And that was true in 2022, and it's certainly true now. The mayor has yet to retract her comment that the carjacker probably didn't mean to kill Rockish and the family hasn't heard from her either. Has she reached out to your family after the incident or did um, you any comment? No, I think a week or so later, um, the somebody from their office called and they, they just said, we are sorry to hear about your son. Meanwhile, Patel's girlfriend is convinced the killer's intentions were set. I, this person that murdered him, had to have been okay with mowing down anyone in his path. Because when you look at that intersection and think, I'm gonna steal this car and get away with it, you can't possibly think, oh, I'll just drive casually down the street, no one will see me. Fox 5 reaching out to the mayor's office to give her a chance to expand on what she meant. Instead, we were given a statement by Deputy Mayor Lindsay Apaya addressing crime in DC, but not the death of Rakesh Patel. 
In that statement, she says Mayor Bowser has set clear priorities for reducing crime, gun violence and juvenile crime to create a safer, stronger Washington, D.C. This means ensuring all residents are safe, victims of violent crime experience justice and those that harm our community are held accountable. And with city officials offering no answers and no arrests made, his loved ones are left to wonder if this case will ever be solved. We don't expect constant updates, but it's been a um, little jarring that it's been two years now and it doesn't seem like uh, the person who did this might be um, stopped from doing it from, to somebody else. Um, but at the end of the day, like, the only thing my family wants is we just want my brother back. And, you know, I don't think that finding this person is <laughs> obviously going to, going to do that, but my parents deserve answers and they deserve to have some peace. They deserve to know why this happened. It is difficult. Life is to go on, you know. You can't get yourself depressed and sit down in one corner. We just try to remember the best days he had. I think in life, we, we always want answers for things and we may not get answers. I was very hopeful soon after things happened when they were able to find his car and there was some, maybe some video um, of the car being cleaned and I said, well, maybe we'll get, we'll get something. I mean, the end result, um, even if they find out what happened and who did it, it doesn't bring him back, but maybe for some people, especially his family, it, it does bring a sense of, of closure. To the leaders, I just say, you know, please, please try, please keep trying, please make things safer. Don't let this keep happening to other families. It's just to anybody's brother, to anybody's son, to their uncle, just the lost years and for no, no reason no good reason to, for a car. As the case seemingly goes cold, Rockish's friends and family are left to hold on to the memories. Still to come with a hole left in their hearts, how they're keeping his legacy alive. He did a lot of little things that were very meaningful. Always willing to help. He, he was very kind hearted. He was always there when you needed him. Um, you, I mean, you wanted company, you wanted somebody to talk to, he'd be there. I think he impacted a lot of lives before he was taken. Rakesh Patel was a beloved son and friend. Anyone you talk to, the people that he worked with, his friends, they will all tell you just how above and beyond he would go for anyone. He had so many people that took such an interest in him in making sure he reached his potential and he had so much to offer. He was taken from us in a terrible way, but we were so lucky to have had the time we had with him. He was passionate about his work and always there when he was needed most. From the stories that I've heard, he was an amazing doctor and he took extra time to listen to you and to care for you. He was trained in infectious disease. He was trained in critical care. So he's taking care of the sickest of the sick. We think back to not that it's over, but we think back to the, the large surges of COVID. We were in those rooms, that's who you needed. You know, the times when we didn't know what COVID meant and Rakish was there. He was, he was in the hospital caring for his patients, doing what he was trained to do and without a second thought. He wanted to be there for people. He wanted to do everything he could to, you know, in the worst mo moments of their life. You know, he was a critical care fellow the moment where, you know, it's a life and death. He wanted to be the person who, who helped people live. The hospital he worked at even created an award to remember Rockish. Shortly after he passed, we wanted to honor him and we said, how do we keep his spirit alive? What did he embody? Not just being a good doctor, but being that person who's gonna do good for people without looking for the recognition. So we said, we need to, have. Let's make an award that and look for people that sort of fulfill 
all those qualities? Do we pick one a year across all the fellows that rotate through Washington Hospital Center and say, who best embodies him? Not just being a smart, good doctor, but who really cares about that patient as a person. In the first year that we had the award, it was one of our cardiology fellows who was, a, who, who was amazing and people loved him. And then the very next year, it was actually one of our critical care fellows. It was the same fellow who called me to tell me about Rakesh. Attendance at Rakesh's funeral was astounding, but still his family wishes it never had to happen. We didn't need a funeral to know how wonderful and loved he was. Rakesh had really good friends growing up, and he kept those friendships, and they flew in from all over the country. There was a snowstorm that day in D.C., and planes were delayed, and his, his friends, they came in, and his cousins, uncles and aunts, ourselves, and everybody came. It's Rakesh. Everybody came. Everybody was just broken. The snow that day, a welcomed sign, perhaps from Rakesh himself. He liked the cold weather and the snow. I just the first snowfall of the year always feels like a hello from him now. We were supposed to go running one day, and I said, well, it's supposed to thunderstorm. And he was so happy, and he said, I love running in like the rain or in the snow. And he says that he, he felt like once he pushes through it, that he's defeated the elements, and he feels so good. If it is raining, or if I'm stuck in the rain, I think to myself, I made it through. His memory will live on in the lives he touched. You know, Rakesh's name meant full moon. Every full moon that comes up, every time my son looks up in the sky and says, where's the moon, where's the moon? I tell him, it's there, even when we can't see it, it's there. That's a big part of how they're gonna remember him. And my daughter is old enough, luckily, to get to remember that loved to play his guitar, and he was showing her too. Even in my office, I still have, it sounds really silly, but they all have a locker and a little name tag. His name tag's on my wall because every day as I leave my office, I see his name. And it just, re it just reminds me, like, be the best person you could be. Forget about the physician. Be, you have to be an excellent physician, but more importantly, be the best person you can be to people. I hope that everyone who knows him, who knew him, remembers how, how selfless he was, how caring, how loving. Yeah. You say that a lot about people when they die, but he just went above and beyond. He was, he was so good, and he radiated that out, and he had a magnetic smile. He is not only lost to us, but he's a loss to the society. We talk about time and healing wounds, and I think what I said when this all happened, you go through all the different stages we all hear about, and acceptance is the last one. The acceptance, I think, for a lot of us has not come. You know, you don't get over it. You learn to live with it. You just, you, you know, you remember the little, little things. He didn't deserve what happened to him. My parents, they live for their children. My mom she cries every day. This is an unimaginable loss. He was just on the edge of being able to, to start living his life, having fun, maybe hopefully getting married, having some kids, cousins <laughs> for our kids. Just, it's all lost now. The, the memories that we, wanted to make our loss, so we have to hold on to the ones that we have. The investigation into Rakesh Patel's death is still ongoing. Anyone with information is asked to reach out to D.C. police. There is a $25,000 reward being offered for any information that leads to an arrest in his case. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jacqueline Matter.